There is a body on the hillock. It is definitely not a person, since by the gray skin and strange physique it can be said right away. The creature is on one knee, its back is hunched, and its chest seems to be pierced by a spear. Due to the fact that there is no moon in the sky, and the stars are too dim to illuminate the earth, it is impossible to say whether this something is sleeping or just motionless in principle. A sneaker steps on the abnormally dark grass and it is absolutely clear that it belongs to a person. The creature is being watched by a guy who practically does not fit into the gloomy picture of the world. Even his usual white shirt stands out too much, and he himself does not seem to be here. Since a person stands close to this creature, it becomes clear that it is many times bigger than a guy, a real giant in the flesh. The giant's legs and arms crumble as if from old age, and the palm is unnaturally bony. The guy looks at the monster's face in amazement and realizes that he sees himself, but in a much worse case, his teeth are sharper than his, his eyes are completely white without pupils, in some places muscles are visible instead of skin. The green-eyed man examines his own hands, as if to make sure that he still looks like a normal self. Did the guy die and somehow ended up in this place? How can this be possible? Turning his head, he realizes that he cannot determine his location. It is dark and uncomfortable here, there is no sun or wildlife. A drop of thick scarlet blood suddenly drips onto a man's white shirt, and he lifts his head up in fear to see who is bleeding there. The monster above his head has started moving and is shouting at the guy something about heroic souls. The creature opens its mouth, whence comes the snow, white light, the only bright spot in this gloomy world. Following the throat, the rest of the monster's body begins to sparkle, as if it is riddled with bullet holes. The guy's face is covered with sweat from the heat, which appeared because of the bright light. His mouth opened in horror from fear and misunderstanding of what is happening and where he is. The space around is absorbed by the radiance and everything disappears. In high school, the bell rings so loudly that it can be heard even on the street. A red-haired girl comes to the forest near the educational institution, who firmly presses her hands to the edges of a short skirt. The petals of the secure tree fall beautifully to the ground. Apparently, the moment of flowering has come. The student is trembling with tension. She even sweated and cursed, biting her lip. She complains that she drank too much tea today, so she can't take it anymore. She turns her head around to make sure that no one is around. The girl squats down, realizing that she has no choice but to go to the toilet right in the bushes near the school in the hope of remaining unnoticed. However, she does not have time to relax properly when a portal appears directly to the side of the student, from where the same guy appears who gently lands on his knees and on the knuckles of his hands. Electrical discharges dance all over his body. The guy rubs his head. The trip was clearly not the most pleasant, but there are no injuries. It's already good. He gets to his feet and wonders where he was transported. All the guy sees is the school and the secura tree. He doesn't even notice the girl sitting at his feet, who still remains squatting, while blushing a lot. The situation is as awkward as possible. The guy remembers that he seems to have died many years ago when humanity was at the peak of its technological development countless armies of ancient monsters suddenly rose from their graves as if not wanting people to become the pinnacle of evolution monsters everywhere staged a mass massacre of mortals however there was a silver lining eastern cultivators and western magicians who had previously been forced to wander for thousands of years and were hardly younger than those monsters now began to return to the human world one by one all countries suddenly realized the importance of immortals, so they began to pursue a special policy to support their forces. As a result, a new teaching called Cultivation appeared in higher educational institutions, where young people seeking to help their countries studied. However, it turned out exactly the opposite. The people who were supposed to rally in the fight against evil spirits only showed their greedy natures and even this situation could be used for their own purposes. Only seven pathetic, unremarkable states also continued to fight for cultivation resources, and because of the whole situation, a fierce war was unleashed. The guy was an ordinary student from a poor family who had no education or skills in cultivation, which in his world was used, unfortunately, not only for noble purposes. However, during the massacre, he managed to find a powerful treasure called the Hall of Heroic Souls, and the wise empress ruling at that moment in Donglung became the mentor of the guy, so he managed to gain enough strength. The great warriors of the present and the past have become the real servants of the heroic Hall of Souls. But because of the power of this hall, the main forces of humanity were in great fear and as a result, he was ambushed during one of the battles with monsters. In order to protect his mentor and at the same time the Celestial, 
who was severely crippled due to the actions of the people who attacked her. The guy went against them all alone, summoning all the heroic souls that were possible. At the moment of the battle with those people, the guy turned to the strongest warriors who existed simultaneously in three worlds, about which storytellers have composed legends throughout the history of mankind. The cultivator spoke on behalf of the last emperor of people and called on the warriors to come to this world once again, asking them to listen to his words in order to accept the challenge. Golden figures appeared behind the guy's back. They were the spirits of the deceased warriors of the past, who folded their hands in a prayer gesture to stand up for the human race on the orders of the cultivator. Last of all, he invokes the great creation of the twelve gods, which he eventually became, Pangu. He was much scarier and more majestic than the warriors, and his strength pressed almost literally. As a result of this battle, the young cultivator, along with the spirits and Pangu summoned by the witchcraft of the twelve ancient demons, were wiped off the face of the earth, even despite how fierce resistance they gave. The shock wave was so powerful that it was felt even in outer space. There is absolutely nothing left of the world. These were the last memories of the guy before he found himself somewhere in oblivion, and after that, next to the girl who decided to go to the toilet in the bushes. The young man is panicking a lot. He doesn't know what's going on, or where he is, or why he made such a trip at all after Paul was in a glorious fight. Looking towards the educational institution, the cultivator suddenly recognizes it. It was the Tian Chuan Cultivation Academy, which was destroyed by demons in his world. When the attack on her took place, only he could get out. The young man looks at the wristwatch that has been on his hand all this time. The time and year are written on the dial, so he quickly realizes that he has returned to the time when the cultivator was 18 years old. He hears a stirring behind him and, of course, takes it for danger, but it was only a student who was pulling on her underpants at that moment. The cultivator can't help but keep silent and asks if his classmate is really pissing here, in an absolutely unsuitable place for this. The guy is unable not to make fun of the girl. She blushes a lot, although before that she was covered with paint from the fact that he appeared here at all. Tears gather in the corners of the pupil's eyes and the next second she bursts into a loud scream that hurts her ears a lot. Other students who heard the scream are rushing to help their president. Something bad could have happened to her. The girl could have been in trouble for herself, so you should find her as soon as possible. Three guys are running past that very Sakura, but they don't notice either the president or an unfamiliar guy there. It's all because the girl grabbed the cultivator and hid with him at the table holding his mouth with her hand and ordering him to be silent if he doesn't want to be buried by her. From lack of air, the guy turned very red. The girl, pouring bitter tears, understands what will happen to her reputation if someone catches them here together. The young man, pressed against her shoulder, on which a bandage with hieroglyphs is tied, as quickly as the academy, learns that the scoundrel in front of him is undoubtedly the president of the disciplinary committee, the most outstanding student of the academy, undergraduate Zhang Yu Yu. The red-haired woman looks out from behind a tree to see what her wards are doing there, who, fortunately, decide to go look for the president elsewhere. Jiang finally lets the stranger go and asks what he wanted to say there. He rubs his jaw, as if the cultivator has suffered greatly from her grip. Before answering the question, the cultivator reminds that the president's underwear is still not in its place and it should be tightened. Jiang lowers his eyes to make sure of the young man's words and starts shouting again, only already calling him dirty perverts. The guy has to pull his knees up to his chest and smoke a whole pack of cigarettes because of the stress he experienced. He got a slap in the face and didn't even understand what he was so guilty of in front of her. The red imprint of the girl's neat palm shines on the young man's cheek. After adjusting his underpants, Jiang asks if he studies at this place and then asks his name. The guy is still smoking nervously, and his cheek is already very swollen, as if he was bitten by a wasp. The cultivator gives his name and the course is Jiang King Cheng, a freshman in the humanities. He explains that due to the fact that his academic performance is quite low, and his family is poor, he does not have the opportunity to attend cultivation classes. Jiang understands that the young man is from a completely different faculty, so he asks a very obvious question. Does he know who the girl herself is? Jan grins, how could he not know the strongest student in the entire university? However, this is not the answer the girl was counting on. Her face is furious with rage, and she asks again if the guy knows who she is. Then Jang realizes what the president means and then says that they have never met her. He does not know who she is at all. Jiang leaves the cultivator lying on the ground, turning his back on him and promising a speedy death if he blabbed to at least one living soul. The president hopes that Jang understood what she was talking about. 
The students, who, like faithful dogs, have been looking for the president all this time, are happy to see that she has been here all this time. One of them, however, notices something completely different. Jiang is standing in a compromising position. Her hands are adjusting her underwear under her skirt, while a guy with a swollen face is sitting behind her. His face takes on a very strange expression when Jiang realizes that they have been caught. The girl playfully asks if this is the future husband of their president, and the second, blushing, covers her mouth from shock. She can't believe that Jiang is engaged in all sorts of obscenities with this guy. The president says that it's not what it seems, but the girlfriends promise to be graves in this matter and not to tell anyone. The most perky of them shows her finger to an unknown guy who, in her opinion, has attracted the president's attention, and Zhang, of course, gives a thumbs up in response, skillfully playing along with the situation. Jiang is not satisfied with this state of affairs, her face becomes very gloomy, and electricity seems to appear around her, which can strike at any moment, and makes all three of them scared when she loudly asks if they are still tired of laughing. She stamps her foot and suddenly the sky is overcast. A real lightning strikes from above, right next to all the students. The girls climb the tree, Jiang just crawled away and only Jiang remained standing in place, boiling with anger and indignation. A hole appeared in the place where the lightning struck. The cultivator's entire face is covered in lumps of dirt. Is this the strength of one of the best students of the academy? There is a nervous smile on his lips, as if he finally realized what kind of person he was talking to all this time. In one of the classes, the latest news was shown on TV. Yesterday hordes of monsters invaded the neighboring city, thereby causing huge pogroms. More than a hundred cultivators and ten million civilians died in one night. Now everyone is asking questions about what the future of humanity is. Will ordinary mortals be able to stand up to the end against this almost invincible ancient mass? Now all hope is focused on those who study at universities, so that later they can join the army and defend their homeland. In the same class sits King Cheng who seems to have just woken up from a dream. The girl sitting next to him looks at him in bewilderment, without words asking a question about what is wrong with him. Zhang carefully looks at everything around him, including the news on TV, and then he suddenly hits his hands on the desk and realizes that everything that is happening is true. The young man went back in time, before the whole world was erased. He shouts to the whole office that now he will succeed, and the cultivator will be able to save everyone this time. Jiang promises not to let the Donglong Empire sink into oblivion and not repeat his past mistakes. The teacher, who had previously solved the example at the blackboard, turns around at his exclamation, as, indeed, the rest of the class. All the students burst out laughing, while Jiang, like a fool, is still standing at his desk, not in a hurry to sit down. Gao Hao, one of the students and a cultivator of the fifth stage, says that it is quite expected to hear such nonsense from the most important idiot in the group. It would be fine if the guy was just sleeping, so he also mumbles nonsense in his sleep. Others agree with Gao, a beggar who has no money for cultivation lessons is going to enroll in the savior of the empire. The second suggests that this fool during the last beating, it seems, the last brains were knocked off. The curly-haired girl, Chen Yun, who, although she looks arrogant, does not attend cultivation lectures, says that their country is one of the six great states in the world, so no one will risk attacking her. Besides, why would the empire need the help of some idiot? But suddenly the girl is very surprised by one thing. Jiang frowns a lot and does not look like a downtrodden boy from a poor family, whom they are used to seeing. Dao, the first bully, is clearly unnerved by the fool's new behavior and reports that he is behaving like a weirdo today. He wonders if he wants to compete with his fifth stage aura against the commoner, the one that Jiang has. Yuan turns away, dissatisfied with the fact that it's a pity to look at a simpleton who is trying to pretend to be cool. Jiang has his own opinion about arrogant students. They were originally born with a silver spoon in their mouth, so they always look down on the less rich. Relying on the strength, power and money of their parents, the impudents always tried to bully King while studying in this place. However, when the academy was attacked by demons, these privileged ones were the first to flee from the battlefield, turning into ordinary ants that were about to be trampled by stronger opponents. The teacher decides to intervene and says if Zhang is not going to listen to the explanations of the material, he can leave right now so as not to undermine discipline in the classroom. King Cheng decides not to show his temper and makes peace. He sits back down at the table, apologizing to the woman, and is even a little surprised that after what he went through, some bunch of garbage could seriously piss him off. It seems that with the rebirth, the guy lost not only his previously acquired skills. Suddenly, the neighbor on the desk calls the cultivator. His face is inexorably changing. 
it becomes somehow softer and even a small smile appears. Zhang does not understand how he could not have noticed earlier that he was in love with Chen Ning. She notices that King is sweating a lot, so she can't help but ask if he had a nightmare. Zhang does not deny, but also does not confirm her fears, because it is impossible to describe in any precise words what his past life was like. Chen doesn't understand how the neighbor has the courage to sleep at the lectures of the evil zoo. Chen smiles and wonders if she might have been in the dream, too. The young man suddenly replies that whenever he falls asleep, he sees her beautiful face in every dream. Ning immediately blushes, not expecting such revelations from a rather innocent question. The cultivator purses his lips, as if holding back tears. Jiang really remembers not the most pleasant thing that happened to him. He bitterly regrets that in his previous life he could not save the girl from the demons that attacked the girl. The clothes on the dead body of the girl were all torn holes, only the whites of her eyes remained. Chen was clearly very scared before she died. King Chen could only sit over the dead girl and cry out in grief that time. If he had at least a small chance to become a cultivator and fix everything, the guy would have died without hesitation in order to become one at that young age. A month ago, a low-ranking demon suddenly showed up at the school and started destroying everything around. Although the cultivator from Tianxi City managed to deal with him in a short time, thousands of students died that day, including Chen Ning. Since that day, Jiang's life has completely changed and it cannot be said that it is absolutely for the good. Out loud, King Cheng promises Chen that he will definitely protect her this time. The girl can only laugh, she is at the 8th stage of development and is in the top 100 students of the immortal rating. Ning mockingly hits him on the nose with his finger, not understanding the meaning of Jiang's words at all. If the young man wants to become her protectors, then he will have to work very hard. King Cheng rubs the spot where the girl hit and looks at Chen in awe. With rebirth, he realized one important thing. Absolutely all the knowledge that goes beyond his era. To return, the return is only a matter of time. An inner instinct tells the guy that someone is watching him right now. These are, of course, the same guys who bullied him earlier. They whisper that the whole neighborhood knows that their brother Gao likes Chen Ning. Jiang is not at all equal to this girl. Therefore he has no right to communicate with her so closely. Gao himself says that the brat thinks too much about himself today. Hao promises to give a reward of 100,000 personally to the one who will make the brat disgrace himself in front of the girl he likes himself. He slams his fist on the table angrily, never before has King Cheng infuriated him like this. Chen Yuan decides to enter into this matter, she gets up from the table and, knowing what she is doing, looks resolutely at Chang. Pointing her finger at King Cheng, she announces to the whole class that the jerk dared to steal her money. The guy, meanwhile, does not even look in her direction, clearly trying to cope with the anger that seized him from the girl's words. Yuan even mentally, though insincerely, apologizes to him for the money that Brother Gao promised. She will be able to go to the faculty of cultivation and become the best among the rest. The sycophants of how mockingly look at Jack. It immediately becomes clear because of whom the guy was in such a situation. The rest are just at a loss, although they are watching what is happening with interest. They are too curious how it will all end. Zhang crosses his arms over his chest and looks gloomily at them all. He won't leave it all that simple. The teacher leans her hands on the table and seriously asks Zhang if what Chen says is true. Gao confirms the words of a friend. Her money is in Zhang's bag. He was a witness to that. He looks like a man who knows that this adventure will work out and the young man will fall heavily in Chen Ning's eyes. King Cheng looks at his lap where his backpack was lying. He is more than sure that the enemies managed to replace his bag, because just dumping the contents would be a disgusting idea. If you search the backpack now, the money will really be there. In addition, there is no guarantee that there will not be things worse than stolen money. Classmates, seeing the guy's confusion, take the side of Brother Gao's company, and believe in Chen's words. One of them always suspected that the idiot Jiang was a bad person, so he did it a hundred pounds. The words pop up that the guy is an orphan and therefore does not have a normal education. How did he end up at their academy? Everything they say, of course, reaches the ears of the accused. As Jiang can see, a group of clowns have already managed to spread all the dirty rumors about him very diligently. King Cheng leans back and wonders why these guys always bullet him and never gave him a pass. Is it really out of envy? Perhaps there is a part of Zhang's own fault in this situation. Maybe they did it because of the weakness of the cultivator, which they used as an excuse and therefore could bully without any consequences. They also might not like the fact that King Cheng is very close to Chen Ning, and in their eyes does not deserve a single minute of the time that the guy spends next to her. I wonder why the people around him called him Idiot Cheng, and not by his full name. The young man decides that in this life he will rebuff them and play with them enough. 
While Zhang was thinking, enough time passes and Chen is already insistently demanding an answer. To be more precise, she does not need him at all. She asks to stop making excuses for her act, since Gao and the others saw it with their own eyes. Yuan demands to return what he took or they will have to search him. The teacher also asks the student to stop pretending and immediately give back the stolen goods. She, like the others, considers Zhang a simple jerk. It's not even clear why Zhu thinks so, because of her origin or because Gao's company is more sympathetic to her. Chen Ning comes to the neighbor's defense. She slams her palm on the table and jumps up from her chair, declaring that they are all overreacting. She grew up with Zhang since childhood and can only speak positively about the guy with confidence. King Cheng doesn't say anything about it. The wreath on Gao's forehead swells with rage. The guy sitting behind Chen and Zhang gets up and asks if none of them are serious. Gao and the others are constantly climbing up to King Chen. How, then, can you believe the words of these people? Yuan smiles, their academy is so merciful, and Ning herself somehow has enough pity to communicate with such trash as Zhang. The girl, as if with true excitement about Chen, recommends not to let the cultivator fool her, because it is many times worse than you can imagine or see. The voice is given by Brother Gao. He knows that Ning's parents took the guy under their wing and gave him shelter. However, does Chen himself know what Zhang really is? Yuan smiles maliciously, standing with his back to Hao. The neighbor asks what they are driving at. Then, with feigned shyness, Yuan admits that King Cheng took something worse than money from her, in addition to them. Her unwashed panties were also missing, and Gao and others caught him. Classmates open their mouths in shock from the revealed details. The students, of course, assumed that he was an idiot, but also a pervert to everything else. It's so disgusting, how could they be around such a terrible person? Someone even starts to feel sick, but this person manages to ask why Chen Ning protects such a scoundrel. Yes, the guy needs to be urgently excluded. Zhang looks like a man who is really guilty of something. He silently listens to all insults in his direction with a regretful expression on his face. Chen stands her ground. Her childhood friend is absolutely not that kind of person. But Yuan also has his own arguments. Since he is so correct, let him let him check his bag. Then everything will become clear. She puts both palms on the desk and leans threateningly towards the guy, wondering if Jiang is against the search. And he just closes his eyes, as if tired of listening to her voice. Yuan advises Ning not to get close to King Cheng. You never know what lustful thoughts are in his head. If he did this to an almost unknown girl, then what can he do with a close friend? The offender promises to hush up the conflict and keep silent if everything suits everyone. Of course, she understands perfectly well that this will not happen. The fire has flared up. She can only pour oil into it. Ning asks what is wrong with this girl. They are ordinary friends with him and what Yuan accuses a neighbor of is completely groundless and obviously not true for every normal person. She turns to Zhang and says that since they decided to let everyone down on him, then let him open his bag, and they will end all these unfortunate accusations. King Cheng almost sighs with regret. The girl, as always, is too naive. The Gao gang behaves too aggressively in front of the teacher, which means that everything is clearly already ready there. If you let these people open his backpack, then it is quite possible that the guy will be in a losing position. Zhang rises resolutely. In that case, we'll have to teach them all a lesson. Although the cultivator lost his skills after rebirth, however, the Hall of Souls returned to this world with him. The hall was cleaned by the ancestor of Tao Hong Jun, who combined the history and myths of the three ancient kingdoms and modern days. The hall was created in order to protect the heritage of civilization. According to legend, a person who possesses heroic souls can move through time and space, summoning warriors of the past and present to acquire strength and new knowledge. Among them there is the greatest god of the bow and arrow, Hui, the nine-tailed demoness, Fox, Da Jai, the hereditary demon, Minghe and the goddess of birth, San Zion Yang. All of these greatest heroes are Zhang's servants. The young man puts his hand to the left side at the level of the heart, and the place begins to glow. The class is plunged into twilight, but people seem to be frozen in the moment because they are unaware of what is happening. By collecting the spiritual Kai of heaven and earth, passing it through one's own soul, the Hall of Heroic Souls can open in this world as well. Behind Zhang, the gates of the Hall open, from where bright light pours. The Hall absorbs the emotions of people's hearts to summon the greatest heroes from around the world. Due to the full scale of souls in the Heroic Pillar, a warrior or others with similar feelings can appear in King Cheng's world. A picture is visualized of how a cultivator calls for a shower. He is inside a room with high ceilings, and a black hole is gathering under his feet, from where Zhang calls for brave heroes who share his remorse and rejection. He asks to hear his call and come here to rewrite the terrible fate of mankind. 
Jiang's cultivation level is too low now, so he cannot summon them into reality and the young man is only allowed to use the abilities of the first stage. The Pillar of Souls, one of six, called Repentance is now full. King Cheng looks at this pillar. From it comes a voice that says that for the sake of protecting the whole being, the young man made a close friend of the owner tragically die, and therefore he wants all three kingdoms to collapse under the yoke of his anger. Jiang does not pay attention to such rude words, only surprised that only six of the seven stars lit up. The Pillar of Souls will continue to absorb the obsessions and thoughts of the whole world, opening up new places for warriors in the Hall of Souls. This will make Zhang even more powerful. King Cheng calls to reason out loud, the six-level soul of God appeared only once when the Buddha himself was summoned. Then, most likely, he will appear before him now. Zhen Yuan Su is the majestic god of the heavens and the ancestor of all earthly immortals. He was a majestic old man with a long gray beard and the same hair, in which there was a gold ornament. King Cheng opens his mouth in shock and asks if he understood correctly that this is the first quasi-saint level spirit in front of him. A magic ball, similar to a capsule, is approaching the hands of the young man, inside of which there is something. And Zhang himself tells with admiration about who Zhen Yuan Su is, one of the followers of Taoism, who owns the magic sleeve technique, which is one of the best among others. This old man is much better than Hong Huang, whom King Cheng was waiting for initially. He had only to learn how to use it perfectly. An old man who appeared all of a sudden, like an inexperienced child who does not even have enough knowledge to materialize a heroic soul, can summon a deity like him. Zhang asks a counter question about what if his wisdom is hidden inside. He claims that even the highest beings of the three kingdoms are obliged to obey him. Zhen complains about the arrogance of the boy, because he himself comprehended all the secrets of Taoism and dominated the immortal heavens for a long time. The young man puts his finger to his chin, seriously thinking about something. The cultivator ruins the seriousness of the moment of the appearance of God and declares that the old man in this case should be called Da Jai Ba. He says this with such a serious face, as if he has learned deep wisdom, and the god behind him can only bow his head to his shoulder and look at the boy in incomprehension. Reality returns quite abruptly to the classroom with students who continue to accuse the cultivator of being a pervert. Brother Gao loses patience and seems to explode with anger. He pushes people in front of him and rushes to Chen and Zhang's table. Roughly pushing the girl he seemed to like in general, Hao grabs King Cheng's bag, who continued to stand there and just look at this scene. Opening the bag, Hao, of course, finds a red purse that clearly did not belong to the guy, and black women's panties. Gao gloatingly tells the young man that no matter how much his stupid head is not beaten, she still does not understand where the place of such a person as King Cheng is. However, now his brother will make him walk with his head down until the end of his days at the academy. Zhang is not lost and wonders if this is really going to happen. Mentally, King Cheng asks the Celestial to lend his strength, and the old man's face almost flattens in response. The boy wants to use his strength to collect women's pantaloons. Zhang corrects him, in modern times, underwear is correctly called underpants. Zhen breaks into a scream, his magic sleeve is a versatile technique, useful both in defense and in attack. Many strong warriors have fallen from it. It is included in the list of the 20 best attacks of all time. The young man does not listen to him at all, already applying the first style of the magic sleeve swaying flowers and a connection of trees on his back. When the technique begins to work, light pours from it, which falls on the face of the god. His eyes roll out of their sockets as he still tries to stop Zhang, ordering him to stop. Gao turns over King Cheng's back, urging him to look inside. Now everyone will know the truth about the pervert Zhang. He asks how they can allow such an unscrupulous freak to stay at the academy, even suggesting that the professor expel the guy and himself not even noticing that the whole class stared at his brother in tense silence as if he were crazy. Yuan looks in shock inside the empty bag, and Chen smiles. She believed and knew that her friend was absolutely innocent. Zhu crosses her arms over her chest and asks the student to take a closer look. There is nothing there. Gao can't believe it and immediately looks down at the backpack, which of course has nothing in it. There is absolutely nothing inside. Sweat stands out on Hao's face, snot flows from his nose, and the capillaries in his eyes burst. How is this possible? He definitely saw the evidence inside, his vision could not deceive him so insidiously. The teacher asks everyone to stop making noise and return to their seats, deciding to hush up this conflict. Yuan grits his teeth angrily and looks at Gao who hurries to follow the teacher's words, not understanding why Zhang got away with it. However, King Cheng himself does not want to leave the situation without a solution. He puts his hand on his brother's shoulder, 
and asks who allowed him to leave. How simultaneously looks at him in bewilderment and indignation and response. How dare an orphan talk to him in such a tone. He doesn't say it out loud, but he wonders what he ate, since he suddenly became so brave and allows himself to behave so strangely. The teacher intervenes in the dispute and asks Jang to reason sensibly. Hao was only worried about a fellow student and did it all out of good intentions. King Cheng is in no hurry to follow her words as quickly as her brother before. The young teacher seems to be young, and there are already some problems with his eyes. He can't help but say this. According to Zhu, it becomes clear that she herself did not expect such an attitude to herself, because she begins to get noticeably nervous and asks what she is talking about. Zhang accuses Gao of stealing things himself, but decided to blame someone else. Can this be called a virtue? Hao wonders if the guy wants to call him a thief, which the young man is obviously doing right now. The brother says that it's all complete nonsense. Everyone knows that he is the dean's son. Why would he steal something in principle if his scholarship is more than 10,000 gold? Zhang slaps him on the shoulder several times and assures him that each of them knows about Hao's material well-being. He can stop worrying about it. No one notices this, but through touching, the cultivator passes the stolen items using the Zhen technique. The next second, a red wallet falls out of the brother's pocket, which successfully opens in flight, and large bills begin to fly beautifully out of it, along with the owner's certificate. Panties also fall on the floor of the classroom, and next to it is a card with the name Chen Yuan, which proves who exactly owns both the wallet and underwear. Zhang continues to talk, apparently, even despite his position. He lacks money and female attention. Gao's face inexorably changes. He becomes like an ugly goblin, in complete incomprehension of how the situation managed to turn in such a direction. Meanwhile, Zhen is shedding bitter tears. He laments that now he is defiled and he can no longer wash himself of such shame. He grabs the boy's head with his ghostly hands, in any case without hurting him with his touches, and Zhang stands happy and it's unclear from what, from how upset the old man is or because he won over Gao. Hao is visibly shaking. How did all these things end up with him? His hands clench into fists with rage, as if very soon he will rush into a fight with his abuser, and who they are is completely clear. A classmate, who is the second after Chen to defend Zhang, states that this is quite expected from the pseudo-great master Gao. He even dares to suggest going to a lingerie store to pick up a set specifically for Hao, because in this case it will be possible not to steal someone else's. Students change their minds very quickly, now they blame their brother for everything. None of them would ever have thought that he was thinking of such things. Besides, the girls have recently complained about missing panties. Was it really all his doing? A real scumbag, since he also tried to blame someone else for this. The guy claims that no one could have imagined that Hao had such a hobby, so he bet many of them were uncomfortable watching King Chen being bullied. But they were too afraid of becoming outcasts, so they just stood aside, making a scapegoat of the young man. Suddenly, an ugly girl, Zhang Mei Pai, a humanities student who does not attend cultivation lectures, tries to jump on Gao from above, demanding to know where her underwear has gone. Hao summons spiritual powers and then hits the freak on the chubby cheek. She spirals into another part of the classroom, leaving a bloody path in flight while her brother shouts at her to get away from him. In a rage, he advises her to look at herself in the mirror first, and only then approach him with such questions. Zhu angrily says that Gao seems to have gone mad. Cultivator students are forbidden to use magic on ordinary students who do not possess spiritual powers. She asks if he decided to go against the rules of the academy. The brother seems to tear off the roof and declares that he is the law here. A vein is inflating on his forehead. Capillaries are bursting in his eyes again. Hao was disgraced by some orphan without a family and a name. Gao stomps his foot with such force that he begins to crumble, and then attacks Jang in a jump, shouting for him to die. The brother's spiritual energy is gathering in the palm of his hand, which would surely kill Jang if he were an ordinary person who does not own the Hall of Souls. King Cheng asks the old man to lend him his strength this time, because he himself sees that the situation has escalated. No one expected such a turn from the seemingly ordinary humiliation of a disciple, even the cultivator himself. Jen says that if they join forces, they will easily show all these weaklings where the crayfish hibernate. Yuan decides to absorb the audience's kai with a magic sleeve to wrap it in favor of the young man, since he has a mortal body that does not have a normal flow of energy. Before Gao hits King Cheng, Chen Ning's silhouette appears on the side of the guys, ordering her brother not to dare to touch her friend with a finger. She picks up a pen in the form of a feather and calls for a breath of wind, 
bringing it together. The girl is a cultivator of the eighth stage, the second best student among the first year students and stands at the 52nd rank in the academy. She throws the pen and hits the target in the middle of the offender's palm punching it through. Hao screams in pain, and blood sprays from his hand in all directions, even more than from the girl who was hit by Gao himself. Jiang looks at the belligerent Chen almost with disbelief. This is a girl who has always been meek and shy, and today she decided to show her character for the first time. And for what? To stand up for King Cheng. He closes his eyes, feeling pure awe and love for Ning. Jiang mentally invites his classmates to enjoy the performance performed by young Master Gao under the name Fetid Mouth. Although Chen stood up for him, however, the young man does not want to remain a weakling in her eyes. Besides everything else, this is a good chance to finally kill the reputation of his brother, the son of the dean himself. King Cheng gives Tom a savory slap in the face. It was made for all those girls from whom Gao treacherously stole underwear, and then wanted to blame this low crime on him. Jiang put into the blow the power of the celestial still standing faithfully behind him. The magic sleeve technique of swaying flowers and connecting trees. Gao's cheeks inflate as if a balloon has been shoved into his mouth, and then flower underpants suddenly fly out of his mouth, instead of with drool and snot. In a word, the guy looks not only humiliated, but also disgusting. Now no one can save him from the decline of his reputation. A bloody maypie, with her face swollen from the blow, suddenly rises from her place against the wall, where she flew away from how hard Gao hit her, and finally finds her missing. All this time her panties were in Hao's mouth, but why did he stuff them there? Students, even guys, are screaming in disgust and a little fear of a fat girl who looks much more formidable than the dean's son at the moment. While Chen stands with his arms crossed, watching the humiliated Gao, and the former offender himself is doused with all the fluids that the human body can only secrete. Old man Zhen is again drenched in bitter tears. He thought they were going to fight, but in the end it turned out that somehow his technique was used again for the sake of to collect even more women's knickers. Zhu's patience is running out. With her short nails she scratches her desk to such an extent that deep furrows remain there. She demands that everyone be silenced immediately and threatens those who will continue to be self-willed, leave them with broken arms and then transfer them to the disciplinary committee for sentencing. Her scream deafens everyone in the audience. The woman now looks more like a wild beast that will rush at anyone who dares to object to her. Gao remembers in horror the people who are on the disciplinary committee and wants to be anywhere but in their tough hands. If even the dean's son is in such a state just from one mention, then they are really terrible people. The frightening atmosphere dissipates as soon as the brother again gives his vile voice. He is still trying to prove his innocence and justify himself in the eyes of his classmates. He begs me to believe him. Hao points his finger at the culprit of all his troubles that have fallen on his head, and says that Jiang probably arranged everything to make his brother guilty and ruin his reputation. King Chen calmly replies that only the dean's son is spinning around here, as if on a frying pan, trying to find an excuse. Did he really think that he could continue to fool the others? Zhang leans over Hao, smiling triumphantly and telling the idiot, stunned by such behavior, that today is simply not his day, that's all. King Cheng straightens up and remembers the words of their great master Gao, who previously said that such thieves and shameless people should not be allowed to lecture at their academy. He boldly suggests that the teacher immediately expel Hao. Gao seeks help from his accomplice, who has been sitting with her hand covering her face all this time, as if she was terribly ashamed of the guy's behavior, and demands Yuan to explain. They put both money and underwear in his bag together. Hao orders to immediately confirm his innocence. The girl closes her eyes as if she has a headache. She suddenly jumps up from the table and asks her brother to stop lying, because it was he who offered her a hundred thousand yuan so that Yuan would slander Zhang. The girl also reveals the fact that the dean's son intended to expel him because he was hitting on the beloved Chen Ning. She even admits that she does not understand why Gao interferes with her dirty deeds. Only he could come up with such lousy ideas. The guy didn't expect such a setup. The result was similar to the effect of an exploding bomb. One of the students simply cannot believe that Gao's company specifically came up with a plan to make Zhang an outcast of society. Everyone heard that the couple burned themselves. Was Hao willing to give just a hundred thousand yuan to ruin King Cheng's life? Zhang almost does not pay attention to the others. He only says that he himself is hardly worth such a sum. But there is one beauty in their group. And then playfully looks at Chen standing next to him. The girl awkwardly hits him on the shoulder and notices which friend is still a good flatterer. Ning can't help but think of one thing. Has old King Cheng always been so cocky? She tries to say that the joke should end, but the guy seems to be going to drown his brother further, ignoring the warning of Zhu 
and the angry Gao. If the case is gaining momentum, then we need to make it even cooler. Jiang grabs his neighbor by the shoulder and promises to follow her on her heels from today, and those who disagree will face only one punishment for everyone. Beating. Chen's cheeks are covered with a slight blush. It is unknown whether she is pleasantly surprised by such words or not. At least, she doesn't try to push him away from her in the first seconds. Hao grabs his head while the others open their mouths. What a bold action for a guy like King Cheng. Zhang looks almost regretfully into Ning's eyes. In a previous life, only he was to blame for her death because of his own weakness. The guy didn't regret anything in his life as much as her death. That day, a monster from an ancient tribe invaded the academy's territory without any warning. Although his rank was low, however, ordinary students could not stop the monster. The academy building turned almost into ruins. Everything was engulfed in fire and destroyed so badly that it was impossible to restore even from memory what it was before. Teachers tried to save their wards, even though some of them had already suffered from the monster. The students ran as fast as they could, bloodied and wounded, full of fear, because the rescuers arrived too late. The monster turned out not to be a miss. It creates a small magic sphere the size of its hand and cuts most of its opponents in half with it. They were just the same teachers who rushed to save the students. The only one from the crowd of panicked people running against the mainstream was Jang. He was clearly trying to find someone and it was not difficult to guess who exactly. Instead of Chen, he finds only her corpse, mutilated, but it is still possible to recognize her. She was lying in a pool of her own blood, with her clothes almost completely torn, and King Cheng looked at her and could not restrain the trembling of all his limbs. Tears welled up in the young man's eyes and if the academy were not empty, everyone would have heard his cry of grief over the death of his girlfriend. These nightmares about Chen's death were the only things he still remembered about his past, apart from the Hall of Heroic Souls. Right now, King Cheng has to do everything so that they don't start chasing him again. In his new life, Jiang promises to end all monsters once and for all, rewriting the fate of his beloved Ning and the others who turned out to be innocent victims like her. Of course, this promise also applies to all those obstacles that hinder the growth of his cultivation. Zhu, however, does not care about such a strong moment. She screams about where the guy dared to put his hands, and how he can even molest the girl right in class, as if he really did something more terrible than a brother stealing other people's underpants. Zhang does not let himself be offended. He himself does not see anything like that in just an embrace. How can such a thing be considered an insult to the honor of a girl? Hao, sitting at his feet, says that his words are really absurd and asks Ning to wink if this scoundrel is holding her forcibly. The teacher supports Hao and promises on behalf of all the lecturers to personally provide protection for Chen, so she should not be afraid to tell the truth. However, it becomes clear from Nin's face and actions that she does not mind at all, and then confirms this with words. She informs that everything is fine with her. Chen mentally apologizes to his friend. His actions will serve as a good cover for his relationship with her. Some guy from Gao's company tries to ask how the idiot Jang dares to touch Chen with his rake, but he quickly shuts up when he sees the formidable gaze of an opponent who promises the most terrible punishment for this person. Hao clenches his teeth in rage. King Cheng decided to play the situation in his favor, didn't he? My brother can't help but admit that the move is very good, especially for such a jerk. But before that, until now, not a single living soul in the academy has tried to stand in the way of the dean's son, realizing where he might end up. Gao promises that Jiang will never set foot in their academy again, not forgetting to call the orphan a pathetic coward. The cultivator just throws his hand behind his head and smiles, asking not to get angry a lot, because wrinkles can appear from this. In one of the classes of the academy, Liu Bao, vice president of the Society of Ancient Martial Arts, grabs some poor guy by the neck and asks if Chen Ning really offended Gao so much. This guy, who is three times bigger than an ordinary person because of the mountain of muscles, ranks 50th in the list of students studying cultivation. He had to stay for the second year because of bad behavior. Hao opens a suitcase containing exactly half a million and promises to give all this money if Bao kills Zhang and catches Chen. The hand into which the girl stuck the pen is bandaged. Bao throws some poor guy aside, forcing his face to break hard concrete, and asks if Mr. Hao is joking by chance. He is an ordinary student, not a mercenary or some kind of killer. Moreover, the girl fell in love with him a long time ago and still remains a kind and sweet goddess in his heart. How can he do this to her? However, of course, money decides everything in the world. Because, pulling a cigarette out of his mouth, Liu asks for a much larger amount than the one that the dean's son brought for such a dusty job. 
Gao asks to offer his price in this case. Then the formidable student asks for 800,000 and the kid will no longer be in the life of Chen Ning and Gao Hao. He also guarantees that the girl will jump into his bed the very next day. However, Bao immediately sets a rather disgusting condition. The first part of the night with Ning, unconditionally, belongs to Hao, but the second will already go to him. Meanwhile, Zhang is enjoying his return, lying under a tree on a bench and talking about how this world is both beautiful and terrible. However, little has changed in this case after his death. Above the cultivator stands Zhen, whom no one, except the owner of the Hall of Heroic Souls, sees. The old man will scold him for behaving too recklessly and impulsively. The guy with whom King Cheng was in conflict has a very hot temper, so it's not difficult to understand that he will definitely try to do everything possible to take revenge on Zhang. The young man does not take the words of the elder seriously, and replies that his behavior has got a lot of people. So why in that case he himself now does not be a shit and make fun of his former abuser? The old man continues to lecture, according to the sermons of Taoism, three troubles and nine misfortunes should be avoided. This rule also includes bickering and swearing. Besides, the guy is not yet strong enough for such strong rivals as the dean's son. Jiang sits down, showing that he is ready for a serious conversation and reminds that he had already destroyed Hao earlier. His act protected many other guys who were bullied by Gao as well as him. The young man realizes that it may sound childish now, but he knows that Gao will soon come to an end, which Jiang will try to bring closer. The old man raises his eyes to the sky, remembering a monkey named Sun Wukun, who was as brave as King Cheng. Then Zhen grabbed him and tied him up in his Wuzhuang temple, where he then tortured the monkey with the sacred whip for three days and three nights. Zhang shows the old man his thumbs up, imagining Zhen in a perverted costume, who at the same time beats the unfortunate with a whip. The elder's nose is bleeding from indignation and asks how he dares to think about such shamelessness. The young man understands that the old man is right. After rebirth, he lost all his magical abilities, and his current body is no different from the body of a mere mortal. It is necessary to enter the initial stage of development as soon as possible, so that after there will be no problems with saving the academy and its students. Suddenly, Jen coughs, attracting attention, and informs that if he is honest enough, he can say with confidence that the level of cultivation of the guy's teacher is not particularly high. If the cultivator wants the old man to become his divine mentor, then he will have to kneel before Zhen and perform the ritual of three throwing and nine prostrations. The celestial confesses that he reluctantly gives King Chen his consent to learn cultivation. If the old man had calculated everything correctly, it would take a month for Zhang to defeat Gao Hao in a fair fight. The young man pugnaciously asks if the Yuan gives him too much time for his training. Is he really not able to teach faster because of his age? The strength value of that asshole Gao is only 5, while the monster that invades the academy has it exceeding as much as 2,000. When the demon appears, no one will be able to survive, and it will be too late to be saved by immortal cultivators. The old man crosses his arms over his chest. How can a boy think that he can easily become the reincarnation of the golden immortal Luo? Even the nasty Gao took 10 whole years to reach the fifth stage of development. Zhang himself will not be able to defeat Hao without the help of a celestial. And if the young man listens to him and trains hard, then within five years he will definitely be able to become better than his brother. Jiang sits in the lotus position and declares that this period is too long for him and today the old man will be able to see what the young man is capable of. There are only nine stages of self-improvement, foundation creation, Kai development, soul purification, transformation, acceptance of immortality, nascent soul, return to eternity, spiritual separation and complete perfection. The strength of each of these stages has a significant gap between them. If King Cheng manages to reach the phase of complete perfection, he will be able to soar in the heavens and achieve enlightenment, becoming absolutely immortal. The old man is sulking with resentment, let the young man act as he knows, in the end he will regret it anyway. Zheng managed to study the technique of the Sutra of the Unified Kai of Heaven and Earth only with the help of fragments of the letters Primordial Chaos recorded in He Tu and Luo Shu. Does the cultivator have any idea what his secret is? He immediately answers his own question. He is the primary source of all magical attacks, so without the knowledge of God, Zhang will never repeat them live. King Cheng does not respond to this, but only orders the stars traveling in the sky 365 days a year to reveal to him the art of primordial chaos. A whirlwind gathers around the old man and the young man, causing the leaves to fly into the air. Zhen is greatly surprised by what Zhang is doing. The child does not absorb spiritual energy, 
but in the name of the Lord of heaven and earth forces her to obey herself. Such an effect can be achieved only at the expense of primordial chaos. The celestial is greatly amazed by the abilities of such a seemingly stupid boy. Jen does not understand how the treatises of the forefather Hong Jun ended up in the hands of an ordinary young man. He watches how much King Cheng is focused on his occupation. After some short time, the guy opens his eyes and announces that the first stage of creating the foundation has been completed successfully. Beads of sweat appear on the forehead of the god. In just 10 minutes, an unremarkable boy managed to pass the first stage of cultivation. It's rare even for an old man like him to see such a thing. However, Jen pretends that he is not at all impressed and says that even if the guy can do something, with his mortal body, it is still impossible to walk around much. Apparently, by forcibly controlling the aura, she has now reached the limit. King Cheng thinks about it and decides to act more seriously in this case. The fighting power of the young man is only one unit. Zhang loudly announces that he is continuing. The formation of the second stage is so powerful that students playing on the sports field see a hurricane that appeared completely suddenly. They stop the game because they are sensibly afraid of a natural phenomenon. The old man, spitting saliva, asks if the young man is a man at all. Jang himself, with his eyes tightly closed, almost begs to borrow a little more divine power from the old man. Jen's cheek turns red from how much he shouts at the young man that he is a damned scoundrel, right number one in the whole world. It seems that a little more and the elder will have a heart attack. Jang abruptly spreads his arms and rises to his feet, invoking the magic sleeve of the second style, the energy of mountains and rivers. The wind enveloping King Cheng twists the foliage so much that the space around it is blurred to a spot. Even an old man is caught up in this hurricane, and he can't help but hold back the loud curses that he has learned in his entire long life. Some still remain on the sports field. The boy shouts to the girl to come out as soon as possible to see something amazing. God has appeared to humanity. When no one comes, he remembers that he doesn't have a girlfriend. Chen Ning turns out to be next to the tornado. Someone's silhouette is visible inside the hurricane, which really resembles God. It can't be anyone else, because how can an ordinary person be there? However, the silhouette of the person inside the girl seems vaguely familiar. Teacher Zhu is also watching the tornado. She hardly believes that she sees the mastery of heaven and earth. Did an outstanding talent descend to them? Can this person be a student of the academy? She orders the disciplinary committee to go to the school playground immediately, because they must immediately find out who owns such power. From the balcony of his residence, a woman looks at the city of Tianchuan, who is probably the one whom Zhang served in his past life and for whom he died. She wouldn't remember that there was ever a cultivation genius in her Donglung Empire who could create such a tornado. An hour later, the tornado finally ends, and Zhang is sitting cross-legged, looking like a Buddha in the light of the sun. Jen opens his mouth, the boy has passed all the initial levels, did he really manage to break through so far? Apparently, in his thousand-year life, the old man sees this for the first time. King Chen gets to his feet, looking at his palm. In the next second, he waves his hand and smashes a stone with one blow. The young man rejoices, having purified the essence, having renewed and restored the muscles and bone marrow. He now has enough palm to break stones and split gold. This is a sign that the stages of foundation creation have been successfully consolidated in his body. The cultivator almost jumps with joy and happiness, how cool it is to have his powers again, which he lost after rebirth. Jiang's watch says that the base stage of the ninth level is open, and the combat power is nine units. Jen flies up to him from behind with a question about what kind of strange object he has on his wrist. The old man has never seen such curiosities. King Cheng tapped the dial with his index finger and says that this is a gift from Chen Ning, a progress watch that is given only to students of the Faculty of Cultivation Development. They are able to determine the current elevation level, as well as combat power by detecting mana. Since Zhang's strength is now at the ninth level of the foundation stage, dealing with Gao Hao will be easier than a turnip. However, if he encounters the real geniuses of the academy, these points will not be enough for him to enter into a real fight with them. He's not talking about stopping the monster that will attack the university in a month. Regarding the Hall of Souls, since the incident with Gao in the audience, Al has continued to absorb people's desires and feelings. As soon as the scale of the pillar is filled with the surrounding world is filled with obsessive thoughts of the surrounding world. One of the immortals who is obsessed with such ideas is randomly called to Earth. In this scenario, a young man can get a skill significant gain to his current skill. The old man listened attentively to Zhang's reasoning. Now he understands that the Hall of Heroic Souls was originally a sacred relic that contained all the myths and legends of the past and present, consistent with the laws of heaven. 
This suggests that the current Gen Yuan is not real at all. He is just an illusion created by an artifact based on his life story. The Celestial puts his palm to his heart and says that the young man managed to summon him only thanks to repentance, used as an obsessive desire. Perhaps the reason for the call of the saints to the world of people is that deep down there are emotions that torment the soul. Zhang replies that the same thing happened to Zheng. He, for example, responded to his remorse, having once experienced the same thing, and decided to come to the rescue. The old man sighs, that's how, so he came to this world because of the regrets of a young man. Zhang abruptly returns to reality, in which Professor Zhu Ran came to him together with the disciplinary committee. Next to the young man, there really is a teacher with a serious-minded Jiang, and behind them three men in black uniforms. Zhu wonders how those terrifying Kai fluctuations that were here a couple of minutes ago could just suddenly disappear into thin air. The Elder orders a search of the territories, because they cannot lose such an incredible talent. The men and the president of the committee rush to execute the order, not paying attention to Zhang who stands like a pillar and does not try to show in any way that he is the culprit of the tornado. King Cheng leaves the scene with a sly smile, because the primordial chaos technique, fortunately, can hide a person's energy and allow him to continue masquerading as a mortal body, because no one really saw the young man. In the evening at sunset, a cultivator walks through the academy grounds, listening to Zhen's reasoning that a truly sinister aura emanates from Zhang's teacher. King Cheng, in turn, says that she is the dean of the direction of cultivation at the academy by the loud-talking nickname Devil. The rest of the teaching staff are her younger sisters and brothers. However, the Celestial believes that this is not the case at all. There is something wrong with the aura of this woman. She has a very strong rage. It is as if she carries the death of at least a thousand lives. It is unlikely that a simple teacher can have such energy. Zhang says that when he was six years old, he was often bullied by other orphans, although they were in the same position as him. After escaping from the orphanage and wandering for a long time as a boy, he almost died of exhaustion, but Chen Ning found him and decided to take him to her house. As a result, they became a big friendly family, even if they don't have a lot of money. In any case, he is glad that he turned out to be with these people. The old man listens to King Cheng's story with great attention. Jen reports that he feels strong currents of Kai near the door to the young man's house. The cultivator is surprised to recognize the head of the disciplinary committee, Zhang Yu. Did the girl somehow find out about his progress in improvement? The Celestial asks to listen carefully to the conversation between Jiang and Chen, since it is about King Chen himself. God snaps his fingers near the young man's ear and applies the secret style of sensitive hearing by Shun Feng Er. The president grabs Ning's hands and demands, What is so good about Zhang? Why does the girl think that he is better than Jiang herself? She looks like a person who won't leave until she gets an answer. Chen nervously asks his girlfriend to calm down and even tries to pull away from her, as if she is uncomfortable with the president's touch. Yu demands an answer to the question of whether she deliberately accepted his confession in full view of the whole group so that Jiang would get rid of it. However, Nin refuses, she did not do it at all because of this. The president cannot believe that gender has become more important to Chen at some point than true love. Ning still pulls away from her and tries to be as far away as possible. She asks you to listen to her words and finally understand that nothing can be between them. Chen explains this by saying that Jiang is a representative of the disciplinary committee, and if someone suddenly finds out the details of their relationship, then a dirty stain will remain on the girl's reputation for life. Yu cringes, as if she hit her. Jen wraps his arms around the boy's neck, as if wanting to support him when he himself is in the same shock as Jiang. The faces of both are covered with paint from the fact that they have learned the details of the relationship of the two girls. The old man cannot believe that he sees the same passionate love of lilies from ancient dowries. Jiang, meanwhile, is outraged that his list of competitors has now been replenished in Jiang Yu. Chen runs into the building and before the automatic doors close asks his sister to promise that from now on she will behave more restrained and appropriately in the future, because now she has a boyfriend. The old man cunningly rubs his mustache. He believes that Jiang's family will soon be replenished, since the two girls look very beautiful together. King Cheng unhappily asks to be a little more lenient towards him. The young man comes to his room. He notes that nothing in this place has changed since his last life. Everything has remained the same as in his memory. Jang sits down at his desk, on which there is a computer and there are several cards with game characters. The younger one says that he found this table with his father at a flea market. He looks at the console on the shelf just above the computer desk and remembers that he begged his father to buy it especially for Chen Ning when she got into the top of the best cultivation students. A little later, the girl gave it to her stepbrother. While Zhang is lying on the bed with a toy robot, 
The old man is looking at the game console. How far technology has advanced with his time. The young man says that his mother does not allow him to throw out his toys. Jang's parents suddenly come into the room, and the man informs them that they want to show the young man something. King Chen quickly sits up on the bed. When you strive to rise, you don't even notice the time count, and as a result, a hundred years can become one blink of an eye. How many years has he not seen his parents? A man is holding a gift wrapped in paper. He says that they are well aware that the young man has always envied their baby Ning because she is studying cultivation and he himself dreamed of studying at the same faculty with her. But financially they cannot afford to pay the registration fee. Parents know that this is not the most fair decision they make him suffer, so they decided to present a present. Zhang looks at them with burning eyes, his father has a heart condition, and the elders have been saving money for his operation for a long time. Although even despite the illness, the man is holding a cigarette in his hands. In a previous life, this amount allowed Zhang to start attending tedious lectures on cultivation. But his father decided to hide the fact that his illness was progressing rapidly and died soon after just a year. The father crosses his arms in displeasure and asks why the boy should worry about the old man's problems. He demands to take money for lectures. The man is a working man, and the mother is just a baker, because both of them are not particularly bright. But both do not want to interrupt their son's desire to get a good education. A woman enters the conversation. They understand that even if the guy does not have as much knowledge as his sister, but if he works hard, he will definitely be able to advance to the stage of creating the foundation, which is already a lot. At least being a cultivator opens up more opportunities for a rich future and a job with a high salary. If the son is doing well, then the parents are happy in this case. However, Jang is not going to listen to his old men and almost rudely pushes them out the door, answering that he also knows perfectly well how hard it is for the two of them to earn money to feed their family because the young man will not take this money under any pretext. He slams the doors behind them. The Celestial sits on King Cheng's bed and wonders why he did not tell his parents that he had already completely completed the first level of development, because this stage is comparable to many of the best students of the university. Jang admits that he just doesn't want to shock anyone, because it's better to first find a way to cut down normal money to treat his father's illness and start studying in the direction of becoming immortal. Jen says that the man just has frequent heart attacks, so most likely the lowest medicinal elixir will be enough for his rapid recovery. King Cheng responds by asking if God knows how valuable pills are in their current era. In general, alchemy was invented in ancient times by two of the greatest sages named Zhen Yuan Su and Tai Shan Lao Jun, whose knowledge can be used to accelerate the development of cultivation restore magical powers and heal wounds. However, at the present time, this art has actually been lost due to the lack of alchemist magicians, and spiritual pills have become an important resource on the way to enlightenment. Even the weakest of them is worth hundreds of thousands of yuan, or to be precise, 800. Suddenly Zhang realizes one thing and asks a rhetorical question about the name of the progenitor and creator of alchemy, because he knows that this person is sitting right in front of him. King Cheng screams with joy, he is fabulously rich, as there is always an alchemy creator next to him who can help him create a pill. Xian doesn't listen to him and pulls out some pictures from under the bed. The young man's face expresses extreme surprise, as if he sees adult magazines for the first time, while the old man carefully studies them. Zhang demands not to even dare to open them and jumps on the elder, causing all the magazines to fly in different directions. Chen Ning appears in the room at this awkward moment, wondering why her brother refused his parents' money. Did youthful pride really rise up in him? She finds a guy among a pile of scattered magazines with his pants slightly lowered from fighting with the Celestial, who can't even really explain what he's doing here. Ning immediately closes the door and apologizes from the other side for the sudden intrusion at such an inopportune time. King Cheng's eyes pop out of their sockets when his sister misunderstands everything. He shouts at the whole house with a request to listen to him, because everything is not what it looks like at first glance. 